Hey everybody, uh, welcome to Calculus. Wanted to take a minute to sort of give an overview or a preview of what calculus is all about. Uh, so just take a little bit of time to sort of get an idea or a foreshadowing of what it is that um, we're going to be looking at throughout the semester. So the calculus is actually um, the only branch of mathematics that properly takes in a definite article. It is properly the calculus. That's Newton that's doing that. But regardless, we call it calculus anyway. Yeah? So calculus, generally, as broadly speaking, is a set of tools, a set of tools for analyzing continuous functions. Okay, so we already have some tools or some knowledge about continuous functions in particular. Spend a lot of time in algebra finding zeros and vertices of quadratics and uh, using quadratic formula and all that stuff to find zeros. And um, we spend a lot of time analyzing functions with the tools that we have, but they're somewhat limited. Also in trig, of course, we're looking at sine curves and, and cosine and those sorts of things. So we have some tools already built from those background notions, uh, clearly what a function is and what it's supposed to do. Uh, but we want some more powerful tools in order to be able to uh, get more information about those things. Okay, so you'll find these tools applied in basically every branch of math and science, sociology, uh, statistics, economics, physics, they're applied, computer science, absolutely everywhere. Okay, but Primarily, there are two overarching tools or operations that the calculus uses, okay? So first, there is the derivative. Okay? These are two new operations like addition or, and subtraction or multiplication division, right? There are two new operations that come in the calculus and so we got our first, the derivative, let's see, the other is the integer. Okay, so these are our two primary uh, new operations that um, come in the calculus. Now, these two operations are designed or are solutions to particular problems, okay? The derivative is the, the solution to find the instantaneous, instantaneous rate of change. Find the instantaneous rate of change. So if we have some curve or whatever, some behavior that we're looking at, and we want to know how is it changing at a single point instantaneously, this equates to, or is equivalent to asking, find, find the slope, right? The slope is our rate of change of the tangent line, okay? These are equivalent. Find the slope of the tangent line. We're looking at some curve. We say, okay, I want to know what is the instantaneous rate of change at this point. Then I want to know the slope of the line that's tangent that touches at that one single point. Okay, so that's the, the problem that the derivative solves. Find the instantaneous rate of change or the slope of the tangent line. Those are equivalent. And the problem that the integral solves is find the area uh, under the curve. Now under, under we mean between the curve and the x-axis. So between the function uh, and the x-axis. Okay, 
Now in general, or not, not in general, excuse me, in, in particular, we can do that for certain functions. Like if, if I have some linear function here, well, I can just, if I wanna find the area underneath that curve, I can just use the area of a triangle, right? This is just some triangle. As long as my function is constant there, that's easy, I can use geometry. Or if it's a circle or a semicircle or some figure that I have a formula for, then of course I can just go back to geometry and use that. Or, you know, if I had some constant function, well, that's clearly easy. It's just gonna find the area underneath. It's just gonna be a rectangle, right? So these sorts of problems we already had an easy solution to, but for the integral, this is asking for some general curve, not just some constant or something that we have uh, a formula from geometry or from algebra or some other place, but just in general. If you throw me some random continuous curve, how do I find the area underneath of that? Okay, so those are the two operations that come along with the calculus and the problems that they're designed to solve. The weird thing ends up being is the derivative and the integral, they're inverses of each other. So these guys are inverse. They undo each other. They're inverses in the sense of the, the formal sense, the functional sense, and like in the way that multiplication undoes division or uh, logs undo exponents, that sort of inverse, that the derivative and the integral, they undo each other, which is weird in the sense that one is the slope of the tangent line and one is the area underneath the curve. So conceptually, that's a little strange that those two things should be inverted to each other, but they are. Okay, now of course, whenever we learn addition, what's the first thing we learn? Subtraction, right? Multiplication, then division. Powers, then roots. Exponents, then logs, right? So we learn an operation and then we immediately learn how to undo that operation, right? So that's what we're looking at here. We'll start with the derivative and then we'll immediately, once we get the derivative, immediately ask, well, how do I undo that? And the answer to that is the integral. Now, there are some other more complicated answers when we get into proper, there are the difference between indefinite and definite integrals and these sorts of things, but we'll get into that later, no worries. Okay. So, those are the two operations that we're looking at and the two problems that we're attempting to solve. Now, let's see why the derivative in particular is a big problem. It was a problem for a very, very long time. So, oops. Let's say I've got some curve. So I've got some f of x, some continuous function, some continuous function on the x-y plane, yeah? Okay, so this is some f. And I say, let's find the slope of a secant. Now, that should be pretty familiar. I think you've probably done it lots and lots of times. You didn't know that you were doing it, maybe. Uh, you've probably seen it as the difference quotient. Well, let's, let's draw a picture. Let's, uh, maybe I should exaggerate this a little bit more, just so it's a little clear. And let's say, here's our x1, y1. And here's some other x2, y2. Finding the slope of the secant line, the line that cuts the curve in two spots, that's no problem, right? That's just straight up slope formula. How am I gonna find this rate of change? Well, I'm gonna take the, the rise, right? Or the, let me say first, the change in y over the change in x. Right, that's our, our slope. So that's uh, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now, what we're really interested in is the slope of the tangent line. We want an instantaneous rate of change. So let's say I want it, um, well, let's say I want it at x1, y1. 
So what I'll do is I've got my secant line. This I understand is no problem. So I'm just going to try to move that second point closer to my original point. Now, so I've got a different x2, y2. I've got one closer now. But um, I still have something finite, right? I still have something that's, that's easy to calculate. It's no problem. There's nothing weird going on. Now, as I continue to do this, my delta x, my change in x, that's what's changing, right? Originally here, this was my delta x, this difference between x1 and x2. Well, I'm reducing that, right? I want really a tangent line. I want it at one single point. So I want these two points to come together and be just one point. So my delta x is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as we go until if I'm at the same point, this x2 minus x1, if they're both the same point, that's got to be zero here. And what's like the one thing that we can't do, right? Divide by zero. So this is always a fail, right? Trying to do this is always a fail. It's a divide by zero every single time. So this was a problem. This was a big problem for a very, very long time. How do we get around this? How do we deal with the fact that there is clearly, like if I wanted to take the slope of the tangent line at that point, that there's clearly some finite answer there, right? It's something like, I don't know, a half or something, right? It's got to be some finite value. But if I actually try to calculate it, the thing blows up to infinity. I get a divide by zero. Okay. So that was the big problem that the derivative solves, and it does so by using the notion of a limit, this idea of getting closer and closer and closer and closer. Okay, so that's, and likewise for the integral, the integral, say we got our function, continuous function, and I'm trying to look at the area underneath of here, between the curve and the x-axis, I say, well, I can approximate that area with a whole bunch of rectangles, right? If I use a whole bunch of rectangles, then I can get a good guess, a good approximation of what this area is. It'll be wrong, right? There'll, there'll be gaps, like there and there, right? But I get a really good approximation that way by using adding up a whole bunch of rectangles. I say, well, that approximation gets better the more rectangles that I use. If I make those rectangles smaller and smaller and smaller, or narrower, and I use more and more and more of them, those errors up there, the places where it misses, they get smaller and smaller and smaller as well. So if I were able, if I were able to add up an infinite number of rectangles, that are infinitely thin, then I'd actually be able to get that area. So we're dealing with this infinitesimally small here, this divide by zero, that, that that change is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, getting to infinitesimally small. And over here, we're dealing with the fact that the, those, the widths of those rectangles need to be infinitesimally small or, or basically zero. And we need to add up an infinite number of them. Say, well, both of these things pose a problem, yeah? Uh, we can't add up an infinite number of things, so we're in trouble. But we know, again, this is some finite area, right? It's got to have some answer. It can't be infinity in the same way that this has to have some definite slope. And so, again, we'll use the notion of a limit, this idea of getting closer and closer and closer, uh, in order to sort of circumvent or get around that fact that at these specific values, we're blowing up and going to infinity, we're having troubles, but we can still extract that finite value, the correct finite value, uh, out of our operations. So that motivates our study of the limit to begin. We need to formalize um, the idea of getting closer and closer and closer.
So you, basically what we're looking at, say something like this, we've got some function, it's not defined somewhere. But it's if we get near to that spot, we're getting closer and closer and closer to an actual value. Even though the function has no value at that place, so I can't say, well, yeah, the f I'll just evaluate the function here. If I just evaluate the function here, I get null, right? It's, it's, or it's undefined, literally, right? It's not a defined function there. But if I get closer and closer and closer from either side, I'm actually going to get some proper value. And these, in fact, will agree with each other. And so I can say, yeah, they're both approaching a certain number, but they're going to the same place, even though that place doesn't actually exist. So that's the sort of double speak that the limit will allow us to do. You know, we can't divide by zero, but if we did, this is what we'd get. We can't add up an infinite number of rectangles, but if we did, this is what we'd get. That's the sort of double speak that um, comes along with the calculus. Now, once we develop the, the notion of getting closer and closer and closer, this idea, it has to be formalized. We can't just willy-nilly say it gets closer as we get closer. Like, what precisely does that mean? Once we formalize that and we have a proper structure of a way to prove that something is getting closer and closer, then we can use that, that skill, the limit, to derive the rules for our derivatives and integrals. The integrals basically fall out immediately from the derivative rules. Once we've derived the derivative rules, what are the integral rules? Or, well, they're just do it backward, right? They undo the operation, so do it backward. Those are generally more or less easy. Um, the basic rules, anyhow, deriving them for the integral once we've got them for the derivative. But deriving those rules for the derivative, we're going to use the definition of the slope of the tangent line or the, the derivative. We'll use the limit to define it and use that definition to derive our rules. Now, we will do a few derivatives using the definition in order to sort of get a handle on how to do it and, uh, and what's going on with it. Um, but I don't want you to get freaked out about it. <laughs> um, this is not what the calculus is in general or in the long run. Doing a derivative by the definition with the limit, it's very work intensive. You you can have 16, 20, 30, 40 line problems. I'm not trying to scare you, but they're algebraically involved because we have to jump through the hoop and avoid this divide by zero. So there's always, every time, it's a fail, right? So every time we have to jump through some sort of algebraic hoops or do some sort of trick more or less, to get around that divide by zero. Once we do that, though, once we've used the limit, the definition, to prove that the derivatives of certain functions are certain things, we don't do that anymore, right? These 20-line problems or whatever, doing the derivative by definition with the limit, it will be a one-line problem. It'll just no easy peasy. Okay, so I don't want you guys to get freaked out about the limit definition of stuff and and get too blinded by um, that. Once we've used the limit to derive the rules for the derivative, we'll use those rules from then on out and and say it's done. We've done the work, and off we go. Okay. So that's basically a, a preview of what calculus is. We've got these two operations, the derivative and the integral. One is find the instantaneous rate of change, or the slope of the tangent line. The other is find the area between a curve or between a, a continuous function and the x-axis. And these two operations are inverses of each other. And we'll study basically the basics of what those rules are and how to use them. All right.